This year, 2024, sees the 60th anniversary of Stanley Kubrick's Doctor Strangelove being released. And there are a number of reviews reflecting back on what a, a major impact that the blackest of all black comedies has made on our views of the Cold War. In many respects, Stanley Kubrick set out um, in many of his films to make the best of every genre. Uh, the Shining, um, a horror movie that takes place in a huge open hotel is a good example of this. When it comes to Dr. Strangelove, um, on the back of his international su success with the studio film Spartacus, Kubrick originally looked to do a relatively straight conversion of Peter George's novel Red Alert. Um, and somewhere along the line, Kubrick looked at the underlying logic and philosophy, what is commonly known as mutually assured destruction, also known as mutual assured destruction, or MAD, and for many people, MAD. And Kubrick concluded that he could not actually make a serious film about an international policy that he considered to be literally insane. And I think this is a very telling comment because in many academic discussions of mutually assured destruction and the Cold War, Dr. Strangelove features quite centrally into the discussion. In many respects, it is the best way to understand what the Soviet Union and America were attempting to achieve, particularly in the 1960s. So Kubrick took um, a straight novel about an accidental um, decision to launch an attack on the Soviet Union by the Royal Air Force and turned it into a distorted comedy because he could not take it seriously that this is how the major powers were lining up. Now, the film buys into um, Kubrick's success with Lolita, since one of the reasons the studio gave the green light for the revised version was their insistence that Peter Sellers plays a number of different characters. And in the film, uh, he plays an RAF officer on secondment with um, an American bomber group. He plays Merkin Muffley, the somewhat inept uh, American president, based on Adelaide Stevenson, uh, who at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis was America's ambassador to the United Nations. And he plays the titular character, Dr. Strangelove. Um, a German scientist uh, whisked out of the falling Reich under Operation Paperclip and at the heart of America's scientific and technical uh, efforts to drive themselves forward with the Cold War. He would have played a fourth character. He would have played the bomber commander, Major T.J. King Kong. But unfortunately, he broke his leg and uh, Sellers was not in a position to therefore manoeuvre himself into the mock-up of a Boeing B-52 um, cockpit. In a brilliant piece of casting, Slim Pickens took over that role. His dry Western American uh, perspective, um, a combination of determination and naivety really carried um, the absurdity of what was going on really uh, to do an nth degree. The central part of the story, the central um, theme of the story, is not nuclear war by design, but actually the idea that with so many nuclear weapons around the world, there is a, a possibility 
that someone could countermand or could undermine the authority of world leaders and launch their own attack. So Sterling Hayden plays Brigadier General Jack D. Ripper, um, who effectively decides the best way to improve the plight of humanity is to bring on a nuclear war through his paranoid beliefs. Now, um, Peter Sellers, um, group captain Lionel Mandrake, tries desperately to talk him down from this pos position. And the straight man, straight man comedy that comes from the byplay of the two of them, the complete absurdity of the situation, that one person can undermine all the checks and balances and launch a nuclear attack really does put what mutually assured destruction meant if things went wrong and it stops being a deterrent and someone undermines the concept. Um, Peter Sellers in playing uh, Merkin Muffley, um, Adelaide Stevenson uh, twice ran against Eisenhower and failed. He was seen as something of as a failure by um, John F. Kennedy, but when it came to the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, stepped up to the plate, as the Americans would say, and made sure that the Soviets were kept on point about what they were doing in Cuba. And Merkin Muffley deals with the situation relatively calmly, but there is a certain degree of ineptitude in the way that he goes about managing what goes on. The balance to that, to a certain degree, is George C. Scott's uh, General Buck Turgeson, the, the chairperson of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, a general in the United States Air Force, and a man who sees the virtue in nuclear weapons, and unlike most people, sees them as a potential weapon as opposed to tool of democracy. So there does come a point where Turgeson says, well, our boys are flying, we could really push this and destroy the Ruskies before they even know what's happening. And uh, there's a very key exchange when Merkin Muffley says, um, I do not want to go down as the greatest mass murderer in history. And Turgis's response is, well, I really think you need to be talking about the here and now and not about your legacy. Um, so one of the, the, the things which is clearly dealt with all the way through Dr. Strangelove is how the group think around mutually assured destruction pervades every part of the thinking. Um, mutually assured destruction as a concept really starts with the Hungarian theorist who moved to uh, America um, in the light of the rise of Nazism, uh, Johnny von Nonnen. And it, it works into a developing form of economics and mathematics known as game theory. The idea is that um, no country would dare to start a nuclear war for fear of massive and annihilating retaliation. And to a certain degree, this is what J. Robert Oppenheimer warned against. It's saying that actually you are defending each other by pointing a loaded gun at the temple of your opponent while they do exactly the same. Okay. And von Neumann and other theorists argued that actually if you have a big enough arsenal, a credible retaliation, no one would start a nuclear war deliberately for fear that everyone would die. Um, and I regret to say that the real message that came out of the Cuban Missile Crisis for the Soviet Union was to build more missiles. So by the end of the 1960s, we had a ridiculous situation of at least 40,000 nuclear weapons in this world. Um, there's a very famous quote um, attributed to Khrushchev 
uh, Kennedy allegedly said to him, you know, we have a an arsenal that can destroy everyone in the Soviet Union twice over. And Khrushchev um, claimed, he said afterwards, said, we're not greedy people in the Soviet Union. We are happy that we can only kill you once over. That is the lunacy that many people saw with mutually assured destruction, leading to the phrase, mad is mad. The key part of um, Dr. Strangelove is what happens if someone breaks the chain of command and chooses to launch a nuclear strike, knowing that there's going to be massive retaliation to actually bring in a nuclear apocalypse. And what is underlying in the tension of the film is the fact that the Soviet Union had created, but had not announced, a, a doomsday network of nuclear weapons. After the Soviet Union in 1949 uh, developed uh, their own atomic bomb, there was a huge push in America for um, the beginnings of the super, the hydrogen bomb, which uh, Edward Teller is seen to be um, the father of, or the self-proclaimed father of. Um, and certainly it's the Ulam Teller equation that meant that a hydrogen bomb could be plain portable. So there's a, a reason around this. Um, J. Robert Oppenheimer very famously said, why do we need a weapon so destructive? Uh, half a megaton, which is what was achievable with an atomic bomb, is enough. Thank you very much. And the Soviet Union made a point in 1961 of detonating the Tsar bomber with a force, I think, in the region of 60 megatons. And if they had actually fused the final stage, could have been 100 megatons. Um, what's portrayed in Dr. Strangelove and the Doomsday Weapon is actually a thermonuclear weapon surrounded by cobalt. And um, this is where Leo Zillard warned in the early 1950s about how the escalation of nuclear weapons could become problematic. If you surround a thermonuclear weapon, uh, a hydrogen bomb or um, a um, fission fusion fission bomb, which multiplies the power of the explosion far beyond anything to do with purely an atomic bomb, the cobalt absorbs some of the explosive power, but becomes highly radioactive and stays radioactive at a high level for years, if not decades. So if you read some of the literature, it is almost as if Leo Zillard is saying, oh, well, we should do this next. Leo Zillard was warning about the dangers of taking these concepts too far and actually making the planet uninhabitable. And what the Soviet Union in the film had planned to do was announce on the May Day celebrations that uh, they had set up a doomsday network and that any nuclear explosion would trigger automatically the destruction of all of their cobalt encased nuclear weapons, which would disperse across the atmosphere and render the entire planet uninhabitable for 94 years. No deterrent is going to be successful if no one knows about it. And that is the central theme of Dr. Strangelove. Although there is a degree of cooperation between the Americans and the uh, drunken Soviet premier who's found in a brothel, um, one American crew, Sam Pickens crew, manages to defy the odds, even though the Americans are giving the Soviet air defences all of the information. And to a certain degree, it is a tribute to the commitment of the service people, that they were in belief that they were going to perform a critical role and however damaged their aircraft was and however difficult the odds were, they needed to actually hit the target. 
and in exploding their nuclear weapon, they triggered the doomsday device. And that leads to the blackest part of the film. Because having been relatively mute for the entire movie, suddenly we have Dr. Strangelove suggesting how the American government could survive. So we don't have an arms race. We don't have a technology race. We don't have a peace race. Suddenly, how many mine shafts do we have and how quickly can we convert them to take people to live underground for a hundred years when the pop when the surface will be uh, safe again it's the escalation and the challenge and the need to be better than the opposition that overtakes everything so it's still culturally a very important movie and it's still actually very relevant today no one really talks about the fact that the united states and russia maintain an active first line nuclear force with 1500 weapons that could be deployed immediately what we see in dr strange love is not merely of the time but that logic of massive retaliation really has not gone away now what was interesting is that very soon after um another movie called failsafe um was shown in american cinemas on a very similar basis except this was done dead straight with henry fonda and walter matow but the similar um premise one um in this case um aircraft pilot making the decision to bomb moscow and to destroy with uh, that city with nuclear weapons it was actually a degree of tension uh, because of the uh, similarities. And I think that was settled um, before it ever got to court. So in the early 1960s, two years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, and with mutually assured destruction, absolutely consolidated as the policy of both America and uh, the Soviet Union, that had become normalized. And what Dr. Strangelove does is put a very strong mirror up to that policy and saying, is this really what we accept? Now, the film was delayed to 1964. It was going to be released later in 1963, but with the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, and the degree to which the American president was mercilessly satirized in the film, it was delayed. However, you do see in American cinema all the way through the 1950s, various quite astute comments about the changing world climate in the presence of nuclear uh, weapons. And the most obvious and arguably the best of the films that developed in the 1950s was Robert Wise's The Day the Earth Stood Still in 1951. Please do not get it confused with the Keanu Reeves remake in 2008. You can happily pass on that one. Now, um, what we have is an alien visitation and ultimately the aliens are as mistrusted in an age of mccarthyism as the soviet union the day the earth stood still has some excellent performances and is a real classic of its time although it is a science fiction film um and we look back it look back at it now with a certain degree of um amazement at the naivety of the underlying plot what it actually does is um relate the real fears of a number of people as to what nuclear weapons 
were going to do to the entire planet. The first thing that's very clear in the day the Earth stood still, okay, from you know, 1951 when it was released, is the division between how governments operate and how scientists operated. And again, you know, thinking back to Oppenheimer, the film, uh, Robert Oppenheimer eventually fell foul of ambitious politicians who prevented him having a government role that could influence the population. I think that that's something that you should think about all the way through. But in this case, Michael Rennie's character, um, Klaatu, apparently comes to Earth offering peace, offering the opportunity to join a league of extraterrestrials in a peaceful existence, so long as humans can contain their desire to experiment with nuclear weapons and particularly put them on rockets and send them into space. Now, from the very beginning, the very first time that, uh, that um, Kalatu reveals himself, raising what was going to be a gift for the American president, it is shot out of his hand by a member of the American armed forces. Anything was seen to be fearful and potentially a threat. And in a, a time when the Soviet or the red um, threat was at such a high level in America, that is how Kalatu was actually viewed. Edmund H. North, who took uh, Harry Bates' science fiction story, Farewell to the Master, and converted it to the 1950s, actually made uh, Klaatu an implicit Christ character, um, including at one point um, him picking up uh, the name Doc, uh, Mr. Carpenter when he joins the um, boarding house that he stays stays in, all right, um, using the information from a dry cleaner's suit tag. And all the way through, what Michael Rennie's character as Klaatu is trying to do is to reflect on what humanity is doing with nuclear weapons. It's worth watching. It's worth watching with Dr. Strangelove as well, because actually um, the Alien Alliance had decided that um, enforcement should be done not by themselves, but by a police force made up of deadly robots. So for most of the film, Gort appears to be subservient to Klaatu. And actually the denouement is to say uh, Gort is the final response. Gort will automatically destroy any civilization which is seen to be a threat through unworthy military action. And in this case, it is taking the point that we have become subservient to the destructive weapons. Once nuclear weapons were created, they are no longer tools for us. They keep us in line. So you actually see a theme all the way through it. I'm just going to concentrate on American cinema at this point in time, because there are other two other movies I'm going to just reference in between um, The Day the Earth Stood Still and Dr. Strangelove that sort of developed some of the themes or some of the fears that were amplified when Kubrick actually makes his movie. Um, 1954 and them with an exclama exclamation mark at the end. This is the era of um, atmospheric nuclear testing around the world, um, but in the Soviet Union, in New Mexico and the Nevada Desert, um, in North Africa, in Australia. Um, and then eventually we start seeing small islands in the um, southern part 
of the Pacific being used. Now, what them really is building on is the fear of radiation. And long before okay, Stan Lee dreamt up Spider-Man or the Fantastic Four or the X-Men or the Hulk, or any of the characters that came in the 1960s that were in one way or the other affected by radiation in the Marvel comic books. Them is a very tense um, and quite shocking movie. It is a B movie. It is not a film with the uh, greatest budget. It is the first feature but it has great merit in its own right because it builds up the tension of the unknown. Uh, you will find comments that says the real fear of radiation and the real problem with radiation comes from that fear. Okay. Well, most people could not conceive of the idea that something that could not be seen or tasted or felt could destroy the genetic infrastructure of a human body and lead to the horrors that were seen after Hiroshima and Nagasaki as people slowly necrotized and died as their bodily functions broke down. You stopped seeing them being repaired. We stopped the regular process by which cells are replaced. So radioactivity is embodied here by ants that are affected by explosion. Okay. The nuclear explosions led to them becoming huge, threatening, and devastating. And that is the key point of the film. Unleashing something that no one really understands what potentially could be the terrible outcomes from it. Another of the great B-movies, so with intellectual and artistic merit, but low budget and never intended to be a main feature, Okay, is uh, the incredibly the incredible shrinking man, um, based on the story the shrinking man by Richard uh, Matheson, who very famously wrote uh, I Am Legend, and was probably most effectively filmed in the early nineteen seventies as Omega Man with Charlton Heston. Okay, in the Incredible Shrinking Man, it brings in another theme from the nineteen fifties. It's thinking about pollution. This is the age of miracle drugs or miracle pesticides like uh, DDT to destroy um, mosquitoes and prevent the spread of malaria. Okay. Or paraquat as an enormously useful weed killer. Products which are banned in uh, most countries um, and uh, in some cases these are the beginnings of the forever chemicals. DDT does not break down, it goes through every part of the food chain and causes problems for every um, creature, every plant that it comes in contact with. So a combination of pesticide and radiation leads to um, Grant Williams character Scott mysteriously shrinking. There's no explanation for this. Suddenly he starts to regress to the size of a boy and then beyond that to an infant, infinitesimally small individual fighting the cat, fighting spiders, using a regular darning needle 
as a lance. Okay. What is terrifying about the film is the realization that as um, Scott slowly, slowly, slowly shrinks, comes to accept his face, a fate rather, that he is going to become ultimately subatomic in size. Whatever change that the radiation and the chemicals have affected his body cannot be reversed. And that ultimately that this is something that although an accident, although it was never designed, he can do nothing about. Now, if you take those themes together, the coming of atomic weapons leading to the potential for Armageddon, the fear of radiation, the unknown of what radiation will actually do to you, and the growth of nuclear weapons in number, and the policy of mutually assured destruction, you suddenly get the normalization of the ability to destroy not only all human life but potentially all cellular life by the time you get to dr strange love so it is definitely worth re-watching or watching for the first time dr strange love because it is a classic film the day the earth stood still probably falls into that category but the other two movies um although not as artistically um as substantial are definitely all worth considering because it gives you an idea in the 1950s when america and and the soviet union were starting their arms race and 1957 uh the year of uh, both the incredible shrinking man but sputnik how the fear of these new weapons was starting to work into the culture that America was regularly paying you know, two bits to go and see at their driving. 